Monday morning. Thank you for joining us for Family Medicine Grand Rounds. And today is our um, special series with the Laura Mann Integrative Healthcare Lecture Series that I uh, work with Kara Feldman Hunt on. Uh, she finds some terrific speakers for us. And I'm really pleased to talk a little bit about Laura Mann and then to introduce the speakers. Um, just to refresh your memories, and for those who've never uh, attended a Laura Mann lecture series before, Laura Mann was a home birth nurse midwife who compassionately served her patients. And when Laura was diagnosed with stage four breast cancer, she learned to thrive by integrating both Western medicine and complementary medical therapies. And in this lecture series, we honor Laura's legacy which brings distinguished leaders to the University of Vermont to share best practices, research, and innovations in integrative healthcare. And today we have uh, two guest speakers, Lori Thompson, Dr. I, I'm sorry, Dr. Julie Thompson and Valerie Goldberg, an RD. And I just a brief uh, bio for each of them, Julie Thompson joined Vermont Gynecology in 2021 after 17 years of training and practice in Western Massachusetts. Julie is passionate about trauma-informed and patient-centered care, integrating functional and conventional gynecology, offering minimally invasive pelvic surgery and focusing on hormonal and gastrointestinal health. Valerie Goldberg is a registered dietitian and the CEO of No Diet Dietitian, no Diet Dietitian has grown to a team of eight registered dietitians on a mission to help people change their relationships with food and improve their health. Valerie's specialties include polycystic ovarian syndrome, sustainable no diet weight loss, eating disorders, and diabetes management. I welcome you both and thank you very much for presenting for the Laura Mann Integrative Healthcare Series. <laughs> Hi, good morning, everyone. Sorry for the, we're having some technical challenges today. Um, um, but thank you so much for having us. It's a pleasure to be here. Um, I'm Julie Thompson, and thank you for the lovely introduction. Uh, very much appreciated. Um, and we're here to talk about polycystic ovarian syndrome today, one of my greatest passions and greatest challenges. Um, so I've got some good news and bad news. I thought I'd start off with the bad news just to get that out of the way and hopefully switch this over to the good. So we are unfortunately really not great, or I could say bad at diagnosing and managing PCOS. And we have a really elevated um, incidence of PCOS that continues to be increasing. Um, currently 10 to 20% of uh, women are affected um, with incidence rates rising. So the good news is um, there's a lot we can do to help and actually reverse polycystic ovarian syndrome. Um, so updates today are focused on this reversible metabolic and hormonal condition. We plan to take a deep dive into the pathophysiology um, to look at the disease process and then focus on lifestyle and nutritional changes that can reverse symptoms. Lost the presentation. We're having some formatting issues, but we're hopefully going to get you a better version here momentarily. <laughs> <clears throat> I'll, I'll just keep talking through our, our goal, <laughs> goals here. So our aim is to um, ease both patient experience and provider experience through the process um, for faster diagnosis and ability and options to give patients um, information that supports lasting change. So we're going to explain the importance of stress management, sleep, exercise, um, and gastrointestinal health, and then review supplements that will um, balance, um, infl reduce inflammation, reduce insulin resistance, and optimize hormonal function. And then Valerie will, will dive into sustainable and evidence-based change for nutritional support um, for PCOS. The PCOS is complex. Should I carry on? Oh, here we go. Oh. Same one. All right, apologies for the font and format challenges. 
Um, so PCOS is complex, as we all probably know. Um, and patients are affected very differently. There are also three sets of diagnostic criteria that can be used. I'm going to advocate that we use the Rotterdam criteria because it's the most inclusive. So we've come to understand that PCOS has varied disease penetrance. Um, so the most inclusive will, will include those that have um, lesser or intermittent symptoms. So the Rotterdam criteria includes two of the three defining symptoms, <clears throat> which is reduced ovulation resulting in irregular menses, um, hyperandrogenism, either clinically diagnosed or based on lab values, and multifollicular ovaries on ultrasound or polycystic ovaries. Um, patients present with these classic symptoms at times, but they can also present with consequences of PCOS, um, being um, insulin resistance, even diabetes, metabolic syndrome, infertility is common, um, and even endometrial cancer. Unfortunately, patient experience is currently compromised by our challenges with diagnosing PCOS in a timely manner. Um, a third of patients report, when we're, we surveyed, um, looking at surveys of polycystic ovarian syndrome patients, we find that a third of diagnoses are delayed for over two years. Almost half of patients see three or more providers before being diagnosed. A majority report being unhappy with care, and there's almost a universal reliance on the internet for management. Patients report receiving vague and generalized information, which leads to a perceived lack of provider knowledge. The majority of patients feel empowered when they get a diagnosis and are supported by local and culturally specific resources. Being diagnosed with PCOS is often validating. It feels like a relief to hear that symptoms are not their fault, that they're not working hard enough, um, and that there's an actual disease process to address. That getting diagnosed <clears throat> with PCOS can also feel like being dealt the worst genetic hand of cards, unfortunately. Um, but putting PCOS into an evolutionary context can help in understanding and normalizing the condition. So genetic studies have, not, have identified a number of gene loci associated with PCOS phenotypes. And based on the frequency and types of those genes involved, PCOS is understood to be a polygenetic trait that results from interaction between susceptible indiv individuals in the environment. So the important message to convey here is that patients aren't broken or even um, even bound to a lifetime of disease, but that this is actually um, a reversible disease process and changing the environment can optimize uh, physiology and, um, and health. So the evolution of PCOS gives that important context I just mentioned, and it can help to shape behavior change and empower patients in finding health. So genetic variants that cause PCOS challenging symptoms today used to offer survival advantages. So insulin resistance associated with PCOS would offer um, enhanced energy storage during times of food scarcity. Hyperandrogenism would support increased strength and fitness and reduced fertility would improve survival rates at times of very high maternal mortality rates. It's our modern lifestyle that we have to blame when food is plentiful, often nutrient deficient, lifestyles often sedentary, high stress and isolation is common. This understanding takes the blame off patients and helps us understand why PCOS is increasing um, and, and how it evolved. Um, so this schematic was adapted from Nature Reviews Endocrinology. So we understand much of the polycystic ovarian syndrome pathway as it's outlined here, and I'll walk you through it. And then there's some newer research that is looking at the um, originating cause. We seem to understand a lot of this pathophysiology cycle well, but where it's originating um, continues to be um, not fully understood. So current research is leaning towards a central neurologic me mechanism of PCOS. So a <clears throat> consistent feature is rapid frequent pulse, pulse secretion of gonadotropin releasing hormone or GNRH, which leads to a mean elevation of luteinizing hormone or LH, and therefore an increased ratio of LH to follicle stimulating hormone or FSH ratio. Um, elevated luteinizing hormone increases androgens. Androgens increase insulin. Insulin in turn reduces sex hormone binding globulin, which increases free or bioavailable testosterone. 
the many underdeveloped follicles in the multifollicular ovaries of PCOS resulting from this central mechanism. Uh, release anti-malarian hormone, which just perpetuates the cycle, gives a positive feedback on gonadotropin release. So recent research um, is focusing on causes of the GnRH elevation, which is not yet certain. Um, we're looking at focuses on focusing on the GABA neurons as GABA levels are higher in the CSS, CSF of patients with PCOS. And the caseptin protein, which stimulates GnRH neurons is also being investigated as a factor. There's a correlation between caseptin levels and LH levels in patients with PCOS. So lab changes with PCOS, they're not universal and they're not essential for diagnosis, but there are some trends that are important to understand when we get these values back and it can also support diagnosis. So very common, as I mentioned, to see that elevated LH to FSH ratio of two to one or greater. In 60 to 80% of patients, we'll see an elevated testosterone level and up to 200 nanograms per deciliter um, can be expected with PCOS. Above that, you'd want to evaluate for an ovarian tumor. We see elevated DHEAS in 30% of patients with PCOS, um, up to levels of 800 micrograms per deciliter and beyond that, you'd want to assess for an adrenal tumor. Insulin resistance is diagnosed in 50 to 70% of patients with PCOS, and often an early marker um, in absence of, of, of true diabetes, we'll see fasting insulin initially and then fasting glucose. And while it's an expensive test and not commonly ordered, if you happen to see an elevated anti-malarian hormone, it's typically two to three times normal. PCOS is the diagnosis of exclusion. So we, it's important when you have irregular menses to evaluate for thyroid disease, prolactin disorder, primary hypothalamic amenorrhea, and diminished ovarian reserve or premature ovarian failure. In cases of suspected hyperandrogenism, it's important to assess for an androgen secreting tumor, non classical congenital adrenal hyperplasia, and Cushing syndrome if Cushing stigmata are present with labs that you've used listed on the right side of that slide. So ultrasound is not required for diagnosis, but it can be supportive. Uh, we'll, you'll see here three different ovaries. On the left is a multifollicular ovary okay, that can be seen with PCOS. It can also be seen in patients without PCOS and is not always present with PCOS. Um, typically slightly larger volume overall, but a small follicles that are underdeveloped, frozen in one stage of development around the periphery of the ovary is common. It's called a string of pearl sign. In the middle is a normal ovary, so slightly smaller overall volume with varied sizes of follicles. And on the left, a ovary with an enlarged cyst, so a, which could be a cause of pain, just being present, but causing torsion or rupture. Um, PCOS in and of itself is not a cause for pelvic pain, so consider ultrasound also in the case of pain for further um, evaluation. So, well, thyroid disease needs to be ruled out as the cause of PCOS, symptoms, symptoms related, related to PCOS, um, it's important to understand that there is um, an increased risk of autoimmune thyroid disorder with PCOS. Data analyzed in a meta-analysis meta demonstrates a threefold risk of prevalence of autoimmune thyroid disorder with PCOS compared to controls. And in the absence of thyroid disease, we also see lab changes frequently with PCOS related to thyroid values, including higher TSH values within a normal range and elevated thyroid antibodies, potentially increasing risk for future thyroid disorder. Um, there are two circumstances that may be beneficial to delay giving a diagnosis of PCOS, that being um, instances of withdrawing from hormonal contraception and in adolescence. Um, after stopping hormonal contraception, particularly the anti-androgenic birth control pills, it's common to see symptoms such as PCOS, flares of acne, irregular menses, multifollicular ovaries on ultrasound. So I typically, in these cases, support symptoms for six to 12 months and then consider repeating evaluation if they persist. And adolescence, as we know, the symptoms of PCOS can describe, describe the symptoms of adolescence being irregular periods, hair growth, weight changes, hair darkening, um, and multifollicular ovaries are more common um, in younger population than they are older. So this certainly clouds um, diagnosis. So there 
um, our situations where it can be valuable to consider a diagnosis in adolescence, of course, in cases of unequivocal hyperandrogenism, so moderate to severe hirsutism or elevated and or elevated testosterone levels, along with two or and or two plus years of irregular menses that might warrant evaluation. You just um, I typically evaluate with caution and really frame it, frame the condition as reversible and not a life sentence, but a reversible condition and one in which um, nutritional support and relationship to food is essential. And, and Valerie's going to dive, dive deep into that later on. So understanding what irregular, what are irregular menses is important in that diagnosis. So we typically expect to see irregular periods in the first year after menarche for one to three years. We ex expect cycles to be 21 to 45 days. Anything outside that window um, meets the diagnosis of irregular periods. Three years and beyond, we see irregular, divine irregular periods as less than 21 or greater than 35 days or less than eight cycles in a year. Um, consider further evaluation if there's uh, one cycle greater than 90 days without another cause, like a blighted ovum early miscarriage. And then evaluation for primary amenorrhea is indicated if there's no menses by age 15 or greater than three years after breast development. So while we understand that insulin resistance plays a role in PCOS, there are several challenges. The first being that we have not defined a way to diagnose insulin resistance short of diabetes, um, that we you know, want agreed upon diagnosis. Uh, are able to detect insulin resistance in 50 to 70% of patients with PCOS. <clears throat> um, and however, there's, there's evidence to support that, that actually women with PCOS are universally, have re universal reduced insulin sensitivity. What we find is that there's tissue specific pathways of insulin resistance, so testing ovarian vein. Um, Values will show ovarian specific insulin resistance in patients that can't be systemically diagnosed. And then a, a gold standard study for insulin resistance is called a hyperinsulinemic euglycemic clamp study or insulin clamp study, which is IV infusions of insulin and glucose to calculate insulin sensitivity in systemic tissues. Of course, not a test you can order on the average patient, it's an academic study. Um, that when this is done on patients with PCOS, we see universal reduction in insulin sensitivity. On average, it's a 27% to kind of average um, reduction in sensitivity. And so like many chronic conditions, trauma um, and stress worsen the clinical course of PCOS. We see that adverse childhood experiences are higher in women with PCOS and anxiety and depression rates are higher than weight matched controls. Salivary alpha amylase and cortisol have been implicated as sensitive biomarkers for stress-related changes in the body, and they have essential roles um, in metabolic homeostasis. Increased salivary cortisol levels and alpha amylase activity is detected in people with PCOS compared to age-matched controls, uh, suggesting a sustained stress scenario with PCOS. Moreover, overweight patients with PCOS have higher amylase activity than lean PC PCOS patients with a significant correlation between alpha amylase activity and BMI or waist to hip ratio. These observations indicate a strong link between stress, stress markers and alterations in body composition with PCOS. Salivary alpha amylase stimulates insulin secretion, also found higher in diabetic patients. Um, and Valerie will be discussing the metabolic changes associated with elevated cortisol. It's important to understand that there's increased prevalence of sleep disorders with PCOS. Uh, we, see L we see increased rates of obstructive sleep apnea and daytime drowsiness in PCOS patients versus weight-matched controls. Um, this is important to consider and assess considering the compounded risk of sleep, sleep apnea and PCOS with cardiometabolic disease and type 2 diabetes. Um, so benefits of exercise like clean need, need no explanation. Um, we do see reduced PCOS symptom distress, disease, um, of the disease, depression, and anxiety rates reduced with exercise and mitigation of cardiovascular disease. Um, so I thought I'd focus more on increased adherence to exercise than the actual benefits, which we're all aware of. So um, we know it's tempting to recommend the optimal 150 minutes of exercise, and this may be more of your 
your wheelhouse and it is mine. I don't do a lot of exercise counseling, so I might be preaching to the choir here. Um, but what we see, as you probably know, is that consistency is more effective for adherence and lasting benefit than intensity or duration. For those that aren't active, consider small um, and frequent uh, exercise events to support habit development and lifestyle change. Exercise is easier to maintain when it's done in or closer to the home in the morning, um, more frequently or daily, um, and with another person um, for accountability and motivation. So um, as you also may be aware, increasing daily activity has metabolic benefits. So we see reduction in glucose responses with 10 minute walks after meals. Insulin resistance and hypertension risks are significantly reduced with standing versus sitting throughout the day. And in, when sitting is required, five minutes walks every 30 minutes through the day um, also reduces insulin and hypertension risks. Dysbiosis is, has been demonstrated to be a contributing factor to PCOS. Dysbiosis is the imbalance between the types of organisms present in our microflora, particularly the gastrointestinal system. Fecal studies have shown that mice that receive um, fecal transplants from patients with PCOS develop ovarian dysfunction and insulin resistance. Reduced microbiome diversity in stool is negatively correlated with hyperandrogenism. There is evidence to support use of probiotics in improving weight loss, insulin sensitivity, lipid profiles, and inflammatory markers. So several randomized controlled trials listed here um, in a little, as little as eight to 12 weeks with these listed lactobacilli and bifidobacterium blends um, show, show marked results. There's no consensus on which probiotic to recommend. I typically choose one with various strains of the lacto and bifidobacterium um, colonies with um, 50 billion live cultures daily, typically for three months, more likely to recommend if they have gastrointestinal symptoms. There's a growing body of research showing variable yet significant results with use of the supplement inositol in treating PCOS. I'm not going to don't worry, I'm not going to walk you through this very complicated schematic, but I thought it might be useful in terms of understanding on the cellular level what this vitamin does, as we often just don't, don't um, take into account the pathophysiology behind supplements. So you, is anyone here familiar with inositol? Is that on your radar? So this is a schematic from Trends in Endocrinology and Metabolism. It illustrates how inositol enhances glucose utilization in cells and reduces blood sugar. Myo-inositol and d inositol are two of the nine different stereoisomers of inositol, which is a sugar alcohol found in many foods, particularly cereals, nuts, and fruits. It's also produced in our kidneys. Um, these exert important, impact, um, important actions on the control of glucose homeostasis and serve as second messengers involved in insulin cascade. Myo and d inositol are involved in a number of biopath biochemical pathways with the oocyte or egg cell as well. Those with PCOS have lower serum d inositol levels and elevated urinary loss of inositol. Elevated glucose reduces myo-inositol levels in tissues and increases its breakdown and elimination in the kidneys. This is an oocyte, an egg cell. I'm sorry for the formatting challenge. Um, so this is a schematic uh, showing that inositol affects the process of steroidogenesis in the oocyte and reduces the production of androgens from the FICA cells. It decreases the serum concentration of testosterone. We see increased insulin sensitivity, decreased hyperandrogenism, improvements in the men menstrual cycle on PCOS. Inositol use of PCOS reduces, as I said, testosterone, insulin, LH to FSH ratio. It's been shown effective in assisted reproductive technologies, IVF cycles, um, and in normalizing ovarian function, improving oocyte quality and, and embryo quality with PCOS. We're looking at 12 randomized controlled, um, tri randomized controlled trials from 2016. We see improvements in ovulation and fertility rates, reduction in body weight and leptin levels, and improvement in insulin sensitivity. Typically recommend um, a ratio of 40 to 1, which 
physiologic ratio in our bodies, and a daily dose is four grams a day, which is what healthy kidneys would produce. Um, it's well tolerated, usually minimal side effects at this dose, occasionally nausea or diarrhea, but again, that's pretty rare. Patients report reduced cravings with it, so they often really like it. It's um, a little bit sweet because it's a sugar alcohol um, and can be mixed and taken as capsules or mixed in, in water. This is a schematic published in the Journal of Clinical Medicine last year and de demonstrates the mechanism of vitamin D and inflammation, insulin resistance, and androgen regulation. Women with PCOS have been found to have lower vitamin D levels than age and BMI matched controls. In PCOS, vitamin D deficiency has been associated with increased ovulatory dysfunction, hyperandrogenism, insulin resistance, diabetes, and dyslipidemia, adiposity indices, and systemic inflammatory markers. An analysis of an 11, 11 randomized control trials involving almost 500 participants with PCOS <clears throat> assessing D supplementation reported reduced testosterone levels, reduced insulin resistance, cholesterol, LDH, as well as vitamin D supp supplementation. However, no change in BMI, DHEAS, and triglycerides or HDL. So here is a review of those three supplements that I just mentioned with the um, doses as well. When recommending these supplements, I typically use an online dispensary and email them a recommendation of brands that I know, and then patients are much more likely to take supplements and they get a good discount. I'm happy to share those details on which supplement brands or which online dispensary that I use. If anyone's interested, I can give patients a 30 percent discount, which is really nice because they can get expensive. And then again, they get that direct prescription or recommendation and buy it directly. So this is a summary slide just to review diagno diagnostic considerations, thinking about typical symptoms, other diseases to rule out, and then lab results that would be supportive of PCOS just to have it all in one place. Consider ongoing assessment with PCOS for, um, to evaluate, to continue to monitor lipids, thyroid function, vitamin D levels, uh, insulin resistance. Um, often I use fasting insulin and glucose for those that would benefit from an assessment of insulin resistance and um, early detection of uh, insulin resistance. Monitor for risks and symptoms of sleep apnea, anxiety, depression, and increased stress and uh, stress management strategies supportive movement and exercise and um, risk of eating disorder. Um, I had mentioned that local culturally specific resources are needed for our patients and that we're all having challenges with diagnosis of PCOS. So beyond this presentation, we're developing a website that will support both your providers and your patients and give resources as to local um, providers and resources to support PCOS information, both for patients and providers to support diagnosis and updated information on PCOS. So coming soon, uh, PCOS, PCOSfix.com. Um, and if any you have any questions for me or Val, I can pass them on. You feel free to email me, um, or if you want to get on a list to have more information for this upcoming resource site, I'm happy to add you to that. So. Um, before I get to that, <laughs> one slide ahead. Um, so we just discussed making accurate diagnosis, the ability to reduce or reverse symptoms with lifestyle factors, supplements um, as well. And what you'll notice that I did not mention is discussion about any weight reduction, which was actually one of the first things I learned in training is that losing weight will significantly reduce or reverse symptoms. Um, of course, learning through clinical practice, I've Found that that is actually not very helpful advice. That um, weight weight is a symptom and not um, not able to be directly modified, which Val is going to dive deeply into. Um, so it's with um, so much pleasure that I have brought Val here today because she's an amazing resource, um, really a local expert on um, polycystic ovarian syndrome and nutritional support for sustainable change. So I'll just take it away, Val.
Thank you so much, Dr. Julia. And it is honestly such a pleasure to be here. My name is Valerie. I'm a registered dietitian nutritionist, originally from Montreal, trained at McGill, and now I am the CEO and registered dietitian at No Diet Dietitian. We are a team of 12 dietitians and growing to help clients and patients change their relationship with food, heal their body image, and figure out sustainable behavioral changes that really help them get to where they want to be with a positive, encouraging mentality. The whole concept of this presentation when Dr. Julia and I were talking about it is we want PCOS not to feel like a, a death sentence or, oh, I'm such a failure, but to feel like it's an empowering diagnosis that we can take control over our health. We can take control over um, our body and for, the, for, our, for our patients to really feel supported throughout that journey. So as we just described, it's complicated to even get a diagnosis of PCOS. And the other thing is most people that, or most patients when they present, they are told, let's lose weight. Let's and the research is really supportive that 5 to 10% weight reduction with patients with PCOS reduces overall symptoms of PCOS. And I want to talk about the challenge. So what came first, the chicken or the egg? Well, we know that PCOS does lead to insulin resistance. And how does our recommendations of lose weight or watch your weight or calories in, calories out, how does that really affect our, our patients? And what do we see in our clinical practice? So we know, and this is, we just talked about this, but there's insulin resistance. Um, we, there's, we live in a culture that is super supportive of dieting and that's not avoidable. We can't avoid that anywhere we go. We go to the grocery store. It's how to lose 10 pounds in 10 days. And what we want to do is reframe that weight truly is a symptom. I think of it as the same metric of height. If a patient would present with scoliosis, you wouldn't just say, okay, we need to get you to gain a half an inch. We would tell them, okay, we need to go to physical therapy. There's so much more. I'm not a scoliosis expert, but we'd give them the tools of how they would be able to increase their spine versus with nutrition. Oftentimes you tell people just to look at that metric, look at your weight, watch your weight. Um, and weight, if we think about it as a non-modifiable factor, we want to become focused on the behaviors that will create that sustainable behavioral change. And also what makes it so much more complicated is all that we just discussed. We know that there's insulin resistance. We know chronic dieting is the number one predictor of future weight gain. There's hormone, hormonal imbalances that make it so much more tricky for our clients um, and patients to heal their body. And we're going to get into some of these hormonal changes. I think they're absolutely fascinating. Dysbiosis has also been clinically proven to help increase adiposity. Um, stress management can lead to both emotional eating, but also that physiological increase in cortisol levels, which also will make it harder for a patient to lose weight. The interesting perspective as well is that even though we know that weight reduction can help symptoms, the research is really consistent that there's huge dropout rates and even short-term studies. Up to 47% of, of patients with PCOS when they're part of a study cannot even complete the study. So the research that we have is really biased and skewed towards people that are able to succeed in these clinical studies, even though we know that they're small amounts of time and people that are signing up for them are typically quite highly motivated as well. What we see in our practice is our clients come to us and they're feeling really defeated. They feel like they're a failure. They feel like these symptoms are their fault. Oftentimes with the challenge of diagnosing PCOS, a lot of people are trying, are starting on their fertility journey. And that's when they find out that, oh, there's this you, you have a condition that's going to make it really hard for you to get pregnant. Speaking of, I'm very, very much pregnant, if anyone is wondering. <laughs> I always think at this stage, it's like ascites, liver disease, or pregnancy, you know, um, grateful for it to be in the latter. But um, they, they, they've tried, our, our, our patients have tried everything. They're hardworking, they're diligent, they've tried keto, intermittent fasting, they've tried Weight Watchers. They're feeling really defeated and like they're, they are the problem. And we want to reframe that as this is not your fault. And we can help you manage the symptoms and feel and thrive in your body. And we think about it having a, a toolbox to present to patients to help them get out of this binge restrict model without get, getting them out of this all or nothing mentality. And we're going to get into how diets can sometimes set us up for being in this binge restrict cycle or why it's a future predictor of weight gain. And then we're also going to talk about hormonal changes that happen as well. Oh, there we go. So we're going to talk about how uh, restrictive diets can lower someone's energy metabolism, talk about hormonal changes, how that also changes metabolic homeostasis, 
and how we have to be really conscious about a risk for binge eating disorder and why that factors in to make it so, so complicated to give um, advice that is seemingly so easy, just lose 5% of your body weight and how this can be so, so, so harmful and so problematic for our patients. So I love to go through this. Um, this is the total daily energy expenditure. So this is how much energy or how many calories our body burns in a day. Um, so I'm just gonna go through this with you. The biggest component, 60 to 70% of our metabolism is our basal metabolic rate. This is how much energy our body burns when it's just lying down, um, not eating, not doing anything, you know, all those things that like filtering blood, all of like the really essential parts of our body that we don't factor in as calorie and energy demanding. And the, there's the two biggest modifiable factors for basal metabolic rate are sex and height. We can't control those. The third factor is lean body mass. So how much muscle mass a human has on their body that we can, that we can modify. The next component is the neat, non-exercise athletic thermogenesis. And this is fidgeting. This is walking. This is non-intentional exercise. You're not going for a run, but you're walking throughout your day. You're going to class. You're going to see your patients. Um, it, also, this is, this is one of my favorites. We'll talk about that because a lot of it is subconscious. It's cultural. It's how, how much do we use our hand gestures? It's how much do we pace? It's how much do we fidget? And this plays a huge role in metabolism. And then up to 20, 20 to 30%, 10 to 30%, depending on the patient population. The next component is the thermic effect of food. So this is, I'm sure everyone has heard the myth, the story that uh, you burn more calories eating celery than it takes to, to, to eat celery, like that whole thing. Well, that's trying to simplify thermic effect of food, but essentially our body does use a lot of energy just in the process of digesting our food, um, which is because the digestive system is peristalsis. It's so, much, it's so much that goes in from mastication to excretion in our digestive system. And then the tiny, tiny, tiny top, which is up usually between 10 and 30%, even with elite athletes, is the exercise athletic thermogenesis. It's how much energy your body expends doing intentional exercise. Our culture puts a huge focus on going to the gym, burning those calories. But again, for the average person, it's, it, it's, it, it caps off at how much our body can expend in a day. So how does this get affected if someone is in a diet? So I want to take you through the metabolic changes that happens when people are chronically dieting and chronically yo-yo dieting. because That's what our culture really, that's what, that's what we see. So the biggest thing is when someone's in a, a large caloric deficit, most of the time they also don't get adequate amounts of protein. And even if they were to have adequate amounts of protein, there's research that shows that um, in, in with severe caloric deficits, people will lose lean body mass in addition to adipose tissue. So we're going to be dropping down that basal metabolic rate. This is, this is compounded of people are losing a huge source of their metabolism, losing the only modifiable factor of their, their, of their basal metabolic rate. And it's really hard. We know how hard it is to put on muscle mass on our body, and that can become a, a cascade reaction as well. Then subconsciously, the non-exercise athletic thermogenesis also declines. People are more apt to take the elevator than the stairs. It's, oh, I don't want to go for another walk. We don't think I didn't have enough energy, therefore I don't have, or I didn't eat enough energy, and therefore I don't have the energy to go for a longer walk with my dog or whatever it is. It just becomes this really subconscious um, homeostatic mechanism that our body takes over and we start expending less energy. Thermic effective food goes down because people are quite simply consuming less food. And then exercise, that's, Again, it's, it's a small component of our total metabolism. However, I do see that for a lot of people, they can just push, it's like mind over matter and they can push through and do exercise even at a severe caloric deficit. With time, that does lead to increased um, injury, instances of injury. So also, what makes this even more complicated? So first we're talking about metabolism. We understand how um, being in a caloric deficit shifts our metabolism. The complicated part is that also that if a patient would get a diagnosis um, of obesity or being overweight, the perception and how they, how they perceive that information can also increase the risk of obesity and eating disorders. Just the idea of, of being fat shamed and the more esteemed the person that is doing the fat shaming, the more that, that is damaging to the patient. So for example, a lot of patients really respect their doctors and they have high regard to their doctor. So a doctor just you know, doing their job and, and telling them, hey, we want to make sure that your weight, your weight is going up, that can actually be 
which makes it so difficult for, for um, the medical providers as well. That can lead to someone actually increasing their risk of obesity and eating disorders when it's coming from a really well-intentioned place. Also, I want to hyper-focus on this, that a lot of the times we, we focus on weight and we don't ask people what their environment is looking like. And trying to think about what are the behaviors that are helpful for creating this behavioral change is something that we love to do in our practice. Um, and we help people in a supportive way build these habits because we're not going to overnight change the way that we live. Um, so that's something that we feel really, really grateful that we can help support people on. And the research shows that a small caloric deficit is the most effective for long-term weight loss as well. And the overly restricted diets and low protein diets are what lead to weight cycling, rapid, so temporary weight loss with future weight gain with the comp compromise of our metabolism. So now we're gonna talk about the hormones and just a couple, because there's a bunch of hormones that play a huge role in um, our body's ability to lose weight and to store weight. And we know, and I apologize again for the formatting, <laughs> um, we know, so we're, I'm going to talk about cortisol. We know that cortisol levels, as Dr. Julie was talking about, are typically increased in the patient population with PCOS. And now let's even talk about the stress that we have in this lifestyle. Again, this diagnosis for most people can feel both reassuring, but also like a double-edged sword of, oh no, I'm doomed to have a life of infertility and type 2 diabetes. And they understand the risk factors that are going along with it. And it can be super, super stressful especially if someone is struggling with fertility at that same time. So we know that cortisol levels are, can be elevated and how cortisol affects our metabolism is that it increases the catabolism of protein. So breaking down muscle mass on our body even furthermore, it decreases lipolysis, so decreases our body's ability to break down fat, also causing insulin resistance on the, at, the liver, at the level of the liver and decreasing insulin secretion as well. So this also just adds to why is it so difficult? Um, I think this is a hormone that doesn't get talked about enough, but neuropeptide Y is um, a really potent or oxygen or exogenic peptide found in the brain. Uh, it's an ap appetite stimulator. And the research shows that in caloric deficits, people have more propensity for craving carbohydrates, which we know is really tricky with this population with insulin resistance. And it makes people less satisfied, making them eat more food as well. And this is something that we sometimes don't even think about, of how our, our environment, like how, how our eating will in fact affect all of our hormones and that cascade reaction as well. This is one of my favorite studies. <laughs> um, uh, I, there is a researcher, um, Dr. Aliyah Kram from Yale, and she did, a, she did a study that she gave participants the same exact shake. It was, um, it was, a, it was a milkshake. And she told half the populations, half the participants that it was this like new high end, cutting edge, protein shake, satiety boosting. And she told the other participants that this 350 calorie milkshake was actually like 650 calories and super indulgent. And the research was really mind blowing in the sense that the people that thought they were getting this healthy protein shake had increased ghrelin levels. Um, they did blood ghrelin levels versus the people that had this indulgent shake that had lower blood ghrelin levels. Um, and this has been supported with other studies that show that our, how we perceive food, our perception of food, even if it's the exact same food, can increase ghrelin. Ghrelin is our, one of our hunger hormones that, that stimulate our desire to eat. So this even makes it more complicated when we have, if we're talking about the morality of food, of what's good food, what's bad food, or eat this, not that, reduce your sugar, lim limit your simple sugars, that perception of restriction can actually cause people to eat more because of ghrelin just being elevated, just being hungrier, which I think is absolutely fascinating. So let's, let's go through this. So the patient presents and they are advised to do some form of, of weight loss, um, reduce simple sugars, eat, eat more, move, eat less, move more, try intermittent fasting, cut out all carbohydrates. Patients really want to comply. They want to do the right thing. They want to feel good in their body. And then this restrictive cycle, and we're going to talk about this also, can lead people to having that restrictive during the day and then potentially emotionally eating or binge eating later on at night as well. And they feel a sense of shame around themselves and feeling, feel like they're a sense of have failure. But in that process, we also might be lowering their total daily 
caloric expenditure of food. Also, due to the lack, lack of weight loss, people sometimes will start more restrictive diets and they'll do more. They'll, they'll eat less. They'll, they'll exercise more. And with time, we know that that's not only going to change our hormones, we're going to change our metabolism, and they're more likely to regain weight. And now they're going to be in a, with less muscle mass on their body, so lower, lower basal metabolic rate. And this can create, and we also know that increases someone's risk of an eating disorder as well. The prevalence of eating disorders is pretty mind-blowing, especially since we know that these are tremendously underdiagnosed in our patient population. Um, but the, with for bulimia nervosa, there was there is the the prevalence of bulimia nervosa in patients with PCOS is at 6.1% compared to 1.1 to 4.6%. Again, we don't, it's really hard to properly diagnose these, these uh, diseases as well. With binge eating disorder, the, there was an increase of, there, I apologize, compared to women, the regular, the populations of women have three and a half percent prevalence of binge eating disorder, whereas with OS, it's at 17.6%. So that's hugely substantial. Um, and then also night eating syndrome was also elevated um, quite substantially. And I can add that slide. Um, I believe that it was up by like 10% increased risk of night eating syndrome with PCOS um, rather than, like, than controls. What do we do? We talk about the problems. What do we do? What can we do? We want to help people change their perspective of being that the way that we're gonna heal is beneficial for all of us. It's not a punishment, it's how we can all have beneficial health and creating those sustainable changes with a really positive outlook and attitude and tons of support. But these are the four components that we like to think about when we're treating a patient with PCOS. We wanna help them have blood glucose regulation. We wanna help lower systemic inflammation. We also wanna focus on body image um, and their relationship with food because people often present with binge eating disorder. And then we also want to make sure that our gut microbiome is in the best place possible. So our whole perspective is about addition. We want to add in foods and focus on what we're adding in. We're adding in fiber-rich, high antioxidant foods. We're adding in protein and healthy fats that will help balance out blood sugar levels. And when we have the emphasis on what we're adding in, the while also factoring in like helping people feel that emotional component around food, the, the simple sugars or the dysregulation of blood sugar will reduce sugar cravings in general. And also the, 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 the hyper focus on like what we shouldn't eat, it kind of just diminishes with having balanced meals, with having really satiating and feeling good in what we're eating. Um, but we want it to be high protein, high fiber and, and low refined carbohydrates, but not coming from a mentality of like, don't eat this more this is how we can present. And I'll show you what we like to consider to be a PCOS plate of what that, would, that could look like. Um, meal timing is actually really huge when it comes to a patient population with insulin resistance. Oftentimes, if someone goes too long without eating, it can actually lead to glycogenesis, so the liver producing and overshooting way more carbohydrates than it would need. And then typically, we're also hungry at that time. So then that glucose load will be really elevated. And with time of having glycogenesis, and food and insulin resistance that can keep someone's blood glucose levels elevated for prolonged periods of time. Um, and also just a reminder, time restricted eating or intermittent fasting is really contraindicated with eating disorders and not everyone presents as an eating disorder. Most patients that have eating disorders are actually in larger bodies. Um, I always say fiber is my favorite F word. It's one of the magical things that we can be adding into our, for all of us. We know that the average American is consuming about 15 grams of fiber. And for women, the recommendation is at least 25 grams of fiber. Fiber is an indigestible carbohydrate. So this slows the absorption of carbohydrates, um, slows the absorption, meaning that it doesn't have as much of an insulin spike and we can have better blood glucose regulation with this. Um, and we have two different types of fiber. We have soluble and we have insoluble fiber. Both of them are very important and we get them from fruits, vegetables, whole grains. And this is, <clears throat> excuse me. And this is something that we want to be helping people increase across the board. And again, it's not a punishment. We know that fiber is clinically proven to help reduce cancer risk, proven to help reduce cardiovascular disease risk, helpful for prevention of diabetes. So thinking about it as this is something that we potentially all could benefit from adding in, 
rather than just because you have PCOS, now you have to add this in. Thinking about it as an opportunity to take care of our bodies and take care of our health. I apologize. Um, so we want to be adding in for the formatting. I want we want to be adding in antioxidants and anti anti-inflammatory foods into someone's day all the time. There's something that's called an ORAC score where they've ranked all foods based on their antioxidant load. And the research is pretty very clear that adding in herbs and spices is the best thing for our buck. So thinking about adding in cinnamon to a yogurt bowl, adding in turmeric, adding in basil, cilantro. It could be it can, it can be very habitual. It also adds flavor and makes food more delicious. Um, so I always recommend trying to add those in, adding in more vegetables and fruit in abundance as well. And then with time, we like to create these sustainable changes of potentially helping people shift from processed and red meat consumption to leaner protein options that are less inflammatory for our body. And with helping people navigate emotional eating, which happens late at nighttime, people typically crave foods that are high in sugar and high in fat. We can and helping them enjoy those those foods in smaller quantities and really making peace with food in their body. We are naturally reducing the anti-inflammatory foods as well in how people are eating. The third component is, is our gut health uh, as well. We want to be making sure that we are helping heal our gut microbiome. I think of probiotics as like planting this amazing seed in the ground. Well, we need to create this environment for that seed to grow and for that, for, that, for that plant to be nourished and grow in our body. And this is where nutrition and environment play a huge role. So we want to be making sure we're adding in prebiotic-rich fiber. That's like the food that the probiotics will consume. And we want to be adding in fermented foods as much as possible. So thinking kimchi and yogurt and kefir and sauerkraut, adding that in. As a rule of thumb, we typically like to recommend people have that at least once a day, and we can build habits um, that support that as well. And supplementing with probiotics, as Dr. Julie mentioned. And then we want to be also factoring in that the gut-brain connection and that gut-brain access is constantly firing and helping people with stress reduction can play a huge role in their, in their gut, gut microbiome and their gut health. Also, we want to be focusing on eliminating alcohol or reducing alcohol as much as possible because that can be really, really detrimental to the gut microbiome and with time also limiting um, refined carbohydrates to balance out insulin resistance, but also to be healing that gut microbiome. So this is what I like to think about as like simple, tangible way of eating for patients with PCOS. Let's put it all together. So if we have half of a plate or at least two cups and two colors of non-starchy vegetables, we're getting in that fiber, we're getting in antioxidants, we're getting in ideally some prebiotics, so gut health, insulin resistance, anti-inflammatory going down. Well, we want to add in some healthy fats to help balance out blood glucose levels and to also turn off polycystic kinase, which is a hunger stimulating or it's a hunger hormone. We want to be adding in fiber rich carbohydrates. And then we also want to be optimizing protein, protein um, in, in a daily basis to support again in our metabolism and also be for, for blood glucose regulation. The research also shows that a multidisciplinary team is the most effective for any sort of sustainable weight loss. And this is where we really love to be able to work with providers and be able to work with patients to create this, this systemic approach. Oftentimes, well, all of our patients that have present with eating disorders, we really help them work with therapists as well and create this team that will help them truly heal. Um, we also want to be mindful about prevention and treatment of eating disorders in this population because they are so much more high risk and um, creating these sustainable behavioral changes. And one thing that I feel super, super grateful about is that with our patients, we get to spend a lot of time with them. So oftentimes physicians um, and providers don't have the luxury of time that we have we typically meet patients for 90 minutes for an initial evaluation and meet with them weekly um, to help them create those behavioral changes. And most people don't know this, but 95% of our patients have full coverage for their nutrition services. It's covered under the Affordable Care Act. Um, and essentially, no copay, no deductible. Very, 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 very lucky that we can help patients in basically a very cost-effective way because of health insurance. So super, super grateful for that. Um, and with that, sustainable changes, creating 
dealing with the challenges that come up and pivoting and creating strategies that can create that sustainable lifestyle change. We want to be really mindful about the avoidance of using restrictive diets. So thinking about reframing everything of rather than don't do this, but like giving them the tools of what we want them to be doing. And hopefully I've given you a little bit of food for thought of how we can pr present that to patients. And we want to have support, non-judgment and accountability because people really are working hard. They're doing everything. And sometimes um, they feel like they're, they're, it's like, how is it possible for you to be doing X, Y, and Z? But we can talk about how metabolisms and hormones can really make it so difficult for our patients to be creating, well, be having measurable amounts of success, even if they are working really hard. So creating that supportive environment. So in summary, we really want you to take it away. The, our, our hope is that today you can think about reframing PCOS for our patients as something that we can, that is, is modifiable, something that we can do, something that with the right team, with the right support, we can set you up for long-term health we can also get the symptoms in remission as much as possible. So we want to optimize nutrition with blood glucose regulation. We want to increase protein intake. We want to focus on a high antioxidant and high fiber way of living and improve gut health while also making peace with food um, and healing your relationship, healing their relationship with food. And we have tons of references. And I want to thank you guys for the opportunity for being here and Dr. Julie for um, giving such a beautiful presentation. <laughs> I believe that we have time for questions. <laughs> Please. Sure. Yeah, I didn't, you know, I didn't have any updates. It's a common, I didn't really focus on the medical management during this talk, but uh, we see inositol at the blend I mentioned having similar effects to metformin. Metformin commonly used as well. I recommend an extended release formula starting at 500 milligrams once a day, going up to 2,000 is tolerated. Common to get diarrhea, recommend probiotics, to recommend B12 supplementation for about a 10% risk of B12 deficiency with metformin use. I don't, I don't have anything updated in that in terms of metformin. Did you have more specific question on metformin use? And I didn't repeat the question, as you mentioned, <laughs> but that was a response to tell me about metformin use with PCOS. Yes. Yeah, So I think that's a great question. I'm going to repeat the question. Um, how do we work with Medicaid patients and people that are struggling with the affordability of the rising cost of groceries and, uh, and nutritious foods? So the first part is I don't control insurances, but luckily right now, Medicaid actually does cover nutrition services um, as medically necessary. So there's no visit limit on their sessions and we accept Medicaid. So I feel very grateful about that. And I don't like, knock on wood. <laughs> so I'm just happy that insurance does cover that. Um, in terms of patients and their affordability of foods, what we've seen with lower income populations is oftentimes menu planning planning and budgeting with them can create strategies for them to um, have more access to, 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 health, to healthful foods. So for example, we've often seen in our lower patient, uh, lower income population, people think or the perceived fast food is cheaper. Fast food is actually tremendously expensive. And if we're, for example, giving someone um, bulk buying oats and chia seeds and frozen blueberries in bulk, we can create ways of them at using their budget, using creative um, menu planning to help support their, both their, both their health and their budget. Oftentimes we lean heavily on frozen foods, which most people don't know has sometimes more nutrient, nutrients and antioxidants and fresh foods specifically where we live, because oftentimes they're shipped overseas. There's really wonderful research to show that when Food is flash frozen, they're picked at peak ripeness and antioxidants are preserved. So again, just working with it, we're working with the patients as well. Hi, 
It's Kim Hageman. Thanks. This was fantastic. I I think it is great that um, nutrition services and consults are part of insurance plans, but we do get in that sticky wicket when patients have high deductible plans, and it, if they haven't met it, it can be very cost um, prohibitive for some folks. And I think that's I think that's um, one thing that I. Right now, again, I can't say I don't. I, I don't work for an insurance company, but right now, um, at least three sessions are covered without the copay or deductible. So even if someone hasn't met their high deductible plan because of the Affordable Care Act, and hopefully that will continue, but most patients, it's as medically necessary. And if someone has um, an eating disorder, which is very very prevalent and oftentimes misdiagnosed, um, specifically binge eating disorder, patients presented like, I don't have willpower. I don't. I can't do this every night. I find myself like eating a pint of ice cream or eating cookies, which truly is. Um, we work with. We work with medical providers. We work physicians really closely. We we don't diagnose this, but it's something that comes up a lot in our sessions. Um, but yes, at least three sessions are fully covered by health insurance. Are there any other questions? <laughs>